is March 30th, 2016. Yeah, let me tell you one thing. I'm, uh, I've lost a good deal of my hearing, so you have to really yell at me so I can get the question. Okay. Um, you're at the studio work of, of Alan Dater on Moss Hollow Road in Marlboro. My name is Alex Connor. Today's production crew is on video camera, Soren Whitehouse on recorder, on audio recorder, Logan McKay, and on still camera, also Logan McKay. Okay. <clears throat> so, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your background and then about your life as a filmmaker and artist. So, when did you move? When did you move to Marlboro? Uh, I moved to Marlboro, I believe, in about 1968. We started renting um, houses, different houses around town. Mm -hmm. For how many years have you lived here? Uh, we built this place in 1973. Um, so I don't know how many years that is. It's a long time ago. <laughs> Would you give me a brief overview of the history of your home and studio buildings? Who built them? When? Etc. All right. Um, the original house over there, I built myself, and I started building it in 1972. Uh, I was working as a freelance cameraman, filmmaker, and so I would go off and do jobs and I'd come back and maybe I wouldn't have a job for three weeks and mm -hmm. so I'd work on it then. What were your parents' names and what were their careers? What were the what? What were your parents' names and what were their careers? Mike. Your parents? My parents. My parents, um, Philip and Edith Dater, and my father and mother were farmers, dairy farmers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where were you born? I was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1943. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Cummington, Massachusetts, a little town Western Massachusetts, on a farm. Where did you go to school when you were young? I went to the Cummington Elementary School for nine very boring years. How many brothers or sisters did you have and what were their names, or what are their names, and where do you live, and what are their occupations? I have a brother, Phil Dater, who lives in Western Georgia. Um, and he is uh, an engineer. Okay. Um, how would you describe yourself as a child? Uh, I uh, was pretty, not withdrawn, but quiet, and I spent most of my time either working on the farm or fishing. I would go off for hours, it seemed like days, down little brooks fishing by myself. What high school did you go to? Uh, I went away to high school to a place called the Barlow um, School in Amenia, New York. It was a private school. What did you do between high school and college? Mm, there wasn't much of the time between high school and college. It's the summer. I went directly into college. Uh, I don't remember what I did. Some summer job building a house, working a, as a carpenter, I think. Mm -hmm. What college or universities have you attended? Uh, I went to Pratt Institute for Architecture my first year of college, and then I transferred from there to Goddard College in Plainfield, Vermont, and I graduated from there. Okay, Alice, could we stop for a second? We're, we're having, we want to try something here. <coughs> You need a battery? I know, I've got batteries, and we're just trying to figure out why we're not getting better, louder sound. <laughs> got a battery? Where? Oh. <coughs> I'm using his hair on the camera. I <laughs> think your hair is so long. I know. Why? You know what I'm doing? Getting really a Excellent! Wild. I'm glad you asked that. When I was 12, 
When I was 12, I had a Kennedy haircut, right? Because uh, he was president and he was yeah. cool. And so what I'm doing now is I'm working up to a when Bernie is president. By November, my hair will be long enough that I'll, people will think I am Bernie. Yeah. Well, your hair just go flat. Though. Except you'll have the... Except, yeah, and then Bernie will see that. He's gonna see and he'll be like, oh, fashionable. Yeah. Yeah, I think do so. That. That, any, does that seem any better? It seems a little, little bit louder. A little bit. Is it, it either it is or it isn't. It should be. I mean, if I'm talking to you like this, is it clear? It doesn't even Testing one, two, three, test. Uh, yeah, it's... You can still hear it fine. Testing one, two, three. That's funny. It should, yeah, you think it would be Yeah, it's not going better. to orange. It's still... Going, staying at the same. Well, it worked with Lisa. It just wasn't optimal. So we'll just go with it. Sorry. Right. <laughs> okay. So um, your plan in college was to become a carpenter? Uh, I was studying at first to be an architect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I decided I didn't want to be an architect, and I just went to a liberal arts, studied philosophy and mm -hmm. psychology and stuff like that. What is your partner's name? My partner's name is Lisa Merton. Um, what has been her career? What has been her? Her career. Lisa has had a career as a weaver and then a um, teacher. Of um, English as a second language, and now uh, she's filmmaking. What are the names of your children? Uh, Adrian Dater, who's now 50, I think. Noah Dater, who went to Melrose School, is 40. And then I have Rosie, who's 18. Mm -hmm. And she went to Marlboro, so. Where do they live now, and what are they doing with their lives? <laughs> Uh, my oldest son, Adrian, is a, a sports writer. Um, he lives in Denver and he writes about hockey primarily, ice hockey, mm -hmm. professional ice hockey for newspapers and websites. Noah Dayer is 40, um, he's an internet marketing person. He works in Burlington, Vermont and does um, marketing for a seed company. Now, Rosie is finishing her last year in high school and she's a dancer. She's going to go to a professional dance world. Yeah. Noah and Ro Roshika yeah. um, attended Melbourne School. Yeah. Roughly, what years were they there, and who were their teachers during the time? Um, Noah went there from about the third grade until, what, eighth grade. Johnny saw Connie Barton, Mr. Edelstein, I think that was his teachers. Rosica's teachers were... Uh, You probably know them. Um, whoever the kindergarten person is now. Ellen. What's her name? Ellen. Ellen. Um, I don't remember who she had for third grade, who that would have been. Oh, it's, no. <laughs> maybe it was Jody Poloni was in there, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, then uh, David, Paul Tuckle, and then Tim and Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. May I ask how old you are now? Uh, 72. What are some of the reasons why you moved to Marlboro? Um, I like its wildness. I like the winters. and. Um, Pretty interesting community of people that the college had attracted. Yeah. 
Having spent your childhood on a farm, what experiences led you to a career as a filmmaker um, as opposed to farming? If you've ever been on a dairy farm, unless you really love it, you want to really get out of there. <laughs> All you do is take care of cows, <laughs> and there's no end to it. And I wanted to see the world. And the first chance I got to go out and go off some places is what I did. And uh, so, in my when I was doing filmmaking, I was always traveling, and I traveled all over the world doing all sorts of great films. So I got uh, away from the farm. <laughs> I liked living in the country, and that's why I came back to Marlboro. Yeah. I didn't like living in New York. That's where I lived for a while. Where in your life did you begin to realize that you wanted to be an artist? Uh, I think when I went to, uh, I was in high school, I started fooling around with uh, doing still cameras, still pictures. And then I went to Goddard to college and um, I started getting really interested in film. There was a lot of interesting films that were coming from Europe at that time. Uh, and a whole new revolution in the ways of looking at films was happening. And it was getting away from the Hollywood um, traditional kind of filmmaking to something that was new and that, I thought that was great so mm -hmm. that's what got me going in that direction. Have you always worked in film or are there other types of work, artwork forms that you have tried or worked in? I didn't get that question. <laughs> um, have you always worked in film mm -hmm. or have you worked in other art forms? Uh, I've always worked, um, I started doing some um, theatrical films where there's actors and all that, but then I started doing uh, documentaries and that's pretty much all I've done since a long time ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. How does one learn to be a filmmaker? How much did you learn in school and how much through working with other people? makers and how much do you learn on your own? Um, I think I got that question. How much do I learn? Yeah. That? Um, I didn't go to school for filmmaking and that was a choice that I could have made. I could have gone to college but I didn't. I started working in for other filmmakers as a, an assistant or something. Just kind of worked my way up in that business and that was kind of good for me because I was able to earn a living at the same time I was learning the craft of it and I needed to earn a living. So. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the filmmakers that you have worked with that have influenced your career? Um, I, the first, first work I did was with um, a man named Lionel Rogerson who ran the Bleecker Street cinema, which was a avant-garde kind of cinema in Greenwich Village. And I worked for him for about a year. And then I worked for another filmmaker named Bill Jersey, who was pretty well known for doing documentaries on, for television, really groundbreaking political documentaries. And I worked for him for a couple of years, and then I teamed up with a, a director named Robert Elstrom, and I worked with him doing sound work and a lot of other, and I worked with him for quite a few years on a lot of different projects. What is the name of your film company? Marlboro Film and Video Productions. <laughs> when did you establish it? Uh, 1973. So, you've also been a part of many great films that you, um, Okay. You have also been part of a great many of a great many films that you weren't that weren't your own. What are some what have been some memorable ones and in what capacity have you worked on other films? Okay. Um I worked with the director Brian De Palma, who was kind of a famous Hollywood guy for a while. 
Uh, I'd worked on one of his films, which was a theatrical film with Robert De Niro. I mean, he was just like a really young actor. Um, and then I worked on a series of films around CBS and it's called The Body Human. It was a pretty popular program about the body. And then it was another series on NBC called uh, Lifeline, which took the, we took the camera into like emergency rooms and hospitals. It was about medicine. Um, and I did, worked, we did a film with, about Johnny Cash, who was a country western singer who was really a big name in country western music. And that was, that was kind of a classic documentary that was done, what I worked on about him. Um, I did the sound on that film. We did another film with Johnny Cash. Later on, we did several films in Nashville about country music. Um, those are ones I worked on for other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you yourself, or have you worked in other genres too? If so, what genres? I've almost always done documentary films, um, and I just um, found making documentaries was a really interesting process. Um, if you're working on a feature film. You might just be the cameraman or the sound man or a script person or something, but you're not really involved with the creation of the story or the making of the film other than just a technical way. If you're working on a documentary, it's like this, you know, a crew of two or three people and you're involved with the, the ideas of, you know, you have to make decisions about who you're going to film or what. You know, and all these decisions get made. And so everybody in the crew is sort of part of that. And it's a much more active way of making films. How do you decide what documentary films make? What process do you undertake to decide what to devote your time and energy to? And do people come to you with ideas? Or do you just come up with everything? Um... Usually, uh, the film, the ideas that we have for making films, kind of come from something somebody will, a story somebody will tell us about, or something we read about, or something we know about. Um, and often it's it's not that it's not it's not like well, like we have a, ten films that we want to do uh, that is a list of them, and they're going to do those. There's nothing like that. These film ideas come out of the blue almost, and if we think they have the right elements, and it's, it's and it and it's the kind of story that we're good at telling, then we'll do it. Um, it has to. There's a number of factors that have to come together or to be right to 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 have us us commit, you know, several years of our lives to doing a, a film because it it does take years. What role does storytelling have in your ideas for making film? And there, there's, if, if you don't have a good story, even in a, as a documentary, then it's going to be boring. Mm -hmm. And so, you've got to find a character that's really interesting. If, if you're making a film about a character, or a person, or a situation, you've got to have some good characters. Um, and there's conflict that they're pushing, they're trying to accomplish something and somebody's trying to prevent them, or sort of the bad guys that are doing something that everybody should know about that you, know, you need to expose uh, conflict. And then I think also, um, we've done a number of films about artists and musicians, and that's not so much about conflict, that's much more about expression and, and um, dedication to excellence, and the, um, the world of, of visual arts and music and pottery, they all kind of, um, they're important parts of life, I guess, and, and so we found them interesting. Uh, not a great answer, but... <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> yeah.
Would you give me a brief overview of your filmmaking career? Please include what you regard as some personal highlights, such as your video of Johnny Cash. Yeah, I'd give you a little bit of that already. Um, there's, there's the. Um, I started working as a, an assistant editor. I was helping the editor stick the film back and forth and films, giving him tapes and stuff. And then, and then I started doing sound work, the just carrying a, a tape recorder while the cameraman was shooting stuff. I did that for quite a few years. Um, and then I started doing the camera work. And I started directing and started producing my own films. When I got to Vermont, I started making my own films. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was working on other people's projects. Um, what was the thing about Johnny Cash, was that? Uh, one of your highlights. The Johnny Cash film, um, I didn't really know anything about country music. And I thought it was kind of hokey stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but we went down to Nashville and I met this guy and he just turned out to be a real artist. I mean, he's an incredibly creative person that lived in the Nashville scene. Um, and we developed as a crew, it was t actually myself and two other people, um, we really developed kind of a bond with him. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes that film and it makes any documentary um, powerful. You can tell if there's there's some sort of um, chemistry going on between the camera and, and the crew and, and the subject. And, uh, and so he really trusted us. Uh, he didn't, there was a lot of um, probably people in the media and the news that wanted to kind of pry into his personal life and sh he had problems with drugs and this and that. And, we didn't get into any of that. We just got it really tight with him, and he kind of opened up his whole world to us by doing that. Uh, uh, that was, I mean, we did concerts, and we went out to um, South Dakota to the uh, Sioux Reservation. Some very, really moving stuff with him. Mm -hmm. Who or what experiences have kept you continuing to engage in filmmaking? Say that again. Who or what experiences have kept you um, continuing to engage in you? Uh, I love every day of it. I mean, it, it's just, it's a fascinating um, career to have. And you, you can be involved in people's lives and all sorts of really intense things and joyful ways and creative ways. And that's the best part of it. You, you're given license to sort of be part of somebody's life that normally you probably wouldn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really, for me, the best part. When your children were young, how were you able to balance your work on location or in the studio with your home responsibilities? I wasn't. <laughs> Sometimes I... I'd be off for days or months working on a film, you know, and the little baby was sitting at home with the mother. Uh, mm -hmm. that, was, that was hard. I think that's hard for most filmmakers. The most freelance cameramen really have a high rate of divorce. <laughs> it doesn't work so well. <clears throat> So your home is right next to your studio. What are some of the personal benefits to having your studio at home, and is there a downside to that? Yeah, I tried to have. I thought maybe it'd be great to have a studio in Brattleboro at one point, and that that worked for about a month. I couldn't stand being down there. I had to drive down there. It was too hot. It was too noisy. I don't know. I, I so I built a studio in my house, and it was very small, but it. Um, it worked for me. Um, some of the drawbacks are that we never get away from work. I mean, Lisa and I live together, we work together, I know, dining room table discussions about work as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, you know, we had a traditional jobs and she went off and did hers, and then we talk about 
other stuff, but it gets a little insidious <laughs> <laughs> after a while. You and your partner, Lisa Merton, have uh, made many, uh, several films together. Do you have separate roles in the making process? Yeah. How does that work? Um, it depends on, the, each film is different, but um, the ideas for the films come from one of us or the other. And um, um, I forget the rest of the question. You guys have separate jobs, so what yeah, else yeah, do you yeah, do? Yeah. Um, the subjects have rarely varied from the arts to education. Now we're doing a film, you know, the last one we did was about an African woman, an environmentalist. Now we're doing a film about a, a, a big issue of having to do with climate change. Mm -hmm. and, I don't know, the idea is just, they're all over the park. What are some of the characteristics that an artist should have? Um, an artist should be um, sensitive to other people and to what's going on around them. They may not be able to communicate it through um, verbally, mm -hmm. but they need to have an ear for what's happening, either in nature or in society, or yeah. you know, they're listening and, and, and putting together their own point of view, their message, kind of taking it in and then being able to put it back out in some form. So whether it could be any form. Yeah. But, um, it's that um, that interest in, in questioning and um, responding to whatever the situation is in some expressive way. Do you work more often at, um, do you work on more than one film at a time? We never work on more than one film at a time. It's just one only. Yeah, it, it gets to be um, all-consuming mm -hmm. working on a film and uh, one is enough. <laughs> How do you balance the camera work and um, what do you, uh, how do you balance the camera work? Do you for one second? How do you balance the camera work you do for other filmmakers with their own projects? Right, I do freelance camera work for other people. Like right now, I'm making a film. There's a woman down in Northampton who is making a film about this idea that in parts of the country they want to arm teachers so that. Teachers have guns so that they can prevent violence in schools. Pretty interesting topic. Oh, I'm shooting a film for her, but um, I usually um, I used to do a lot more freelance work for other people, but as I'm doing more of our own projects, I, uh, I do less of that. Um, if a project is interesting, I'll take it on. I'll say yes to it. If I don't like doing boring. I won't go out and do a car commercial or some. Something that I think is just a waste of my time. Mm -hmm. I can pick and choose if I want. Um, would you describe your current film? Uh, yeah, the current film is about the issues of burning biomass to produce electricity. Um, um, it's about climate change, really, because we're all aware that climate is changing because there's too much carbon in the atmosphere. And they came up with this idea that burning biomass would be a great way to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere to, to make it a more green environmentally thing. And that's a completely false idea. Uh, it, burning wood puts more carbon into the atmosphere than burning coal, for instance. Um, so we're kind of exposing this, um, this false idea in this film. Would you give an example of the entire process of making a film? from the first idea to the finished product? Um, 
how does it change or evolve? Is yeah, that... just the process of it. Yeah, it really always changes. Um, we knit, we don't work with a script. Mm -hmm. We don't have any script. We have no idea what we're going to do. We just start. Okay, well, let's talk to this person, and then we gather the footage. It's it's like hunting and gathering. You know, you go out and gather all this stuff together. Um, but you learn as you go either that your initial idea was sort of wrong or it, you really should be looking over here instead of over there. So it evolves. So you have to really keep an eye on, on it. And if you, know, if you, have, you go out with this idea of a script and you're going to do this and that, you, usually reality does not fit into that pattern that you're expecting. It's much better to be flexible. Mm -hmm. um, keep your eye out. What inspires you? Oh. Um, I'm not sure. I just like, uh, I love the what happens in filmmaking. I love the interaction between the camera and the subjects and the sort of dance that goes on. Um, uh, there's some moments, you know, there's moments in filmmaking that are just so special that you you know, you might only capture a few of them in your lifetime, but where people are really open or something happens and um, that's what I'd look for. I'll tell you, I've kind of live for those moments. And, um, that's why I don't want to spend a lot of time doing films that aren't in that, looking for that, you know, at that level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Making doc documentaries is one part of your work. Running the business part is another. How have you learned from the business and um, the promotional parts of Marvel Films production? Yeah, I've done a lot of um, promotional videos to make enough money to keep, you know, make a living. Mm -hmm. um, I've done films for the Crane Paper Company about how they make paper. I did a another f couple of films, I think, for. Um, the Orvis company that makes fly rods and um, oh gosh, I forget some of the other commercial projects. Um, most of them are pretty interesting. Uh, just technically, they might be interesting. Uh, a lot of films um, about education, and um, we just finished a film last year for HCRS, which is a social work. Um, agency. Mm -hmm. we did a, that was a commercial film that we did. Did one for the School of the Deaf. Did another one for Marlboro College. That's the kind of thing. What are some of the ways that you sell your work? What are the, some of the ones I what? What are the, some of the ways like? Oh, we sell. You, yeah. We sell the work. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Um. Usually, we show our films in film festivals, and that gets uh, either awards or gets an interest. And then we uh, we might might in the last film, public television came to us and said, um, "We want to buy this film and put it on television." Uh, that was a um, that's that's the way we do it. If an in, it's an independent film, we, that's the way we do it. What film festivals have been successful for you, and how do you determine a success at a film film festival? Uh, the, I think the, probably the last film that we did on Mangar Mathai called Taking Root um, was the most successful in terms of film festivals. I think it got into something like 50 different film festivals all over the world, and uh, the one in Toronto is called Hot Docs. That was, it won the audience award there out of some of the best documentaries that made that year that won the award. So, um, and then this, you know, the, the small film festivals all over the country that are, this is fun. Once, once you get on a roll, if you've got a good film, it's fun to do it for a while because you get to see other people's films and mm. talk with other filmmakers. And, and show your film, and, and of course, people want to talk about it. Um, who is your typical buyer um, for your documentaries, and who are some of your clients? Uh, yeah, the buyer stuff is is tough. Um, 
I think HBO has been pretty good at producing documentaries. Public television, uh, PBS is, is the primary one uh, that we've dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's about it. Is there such thing as typical, and would you describe a typical day of filming from when you get up to when you finish your day? Yeah, the typical days. I mean, we're about to set off on a week of shooting um, down south. Um, we've set up, I think, two or three different interviews that we're going to do on the road in Washington. Um, and then we're going to do some filming of location work. We're going to film some power plants and logging trucks. And we're going to a convention where they're going to, all these people are trying to sell this idea of biomass. Um, typical day, you know, you get up and pull, get all your stuff together, um, go out. <laughs> Try to get it accomplished. Would you speak a bit about your film Home to Tibet? Um, <coughs> yeah. What were some of the most in more interesting and exciting parts of making that film? Um, yeah, I was just. It, it began because I was down in Brattleboro working, uh, doing some filming at the Rudyard Kipling home, and there was this Tibetan man who was a stonemason who was rebuilding the stone walls. And I got to talking to him, and he's told me he, about that he had grown up in Tibet, and he, he was going to go back there. Uh, he had escaped like 15 years or something before, and he was going to try to get back into Tibet to see his sister. Mm. And I thought about it, and I think I asked him right that same day if I could go with him. And he said, oh yeah, sure. He said, we're going to leave in about a month. So, um, we... I went out and bought a camera that I thought I could use. And sure enough, about a month later, we were on, was flying to India. We met the Dalai Lama in India and talked with him. <coughs> and, uh, and Generally speaking, what is the amount of time uh, spent filming on a location versus the amount of time spent on post-production? For example, with your film, Wangari, <laughs> um, we spend, I think probably in this biomass film we're going to do 40 days of location work, at least that many. <clears throat> and I don't know how long the film is going to be, maybe a, a half an hour, an hour. Um, and then editing will probably take at least six months, probably more. Um. Where all did you take in? Um, where all did you travel to in order to make that film? Which film? Uh, <clears throat> Wangari. Oh, on Wangari. Yeah. Uh, that film we traveled primarily to Kenya. She lived in Kenya, and so I think we took. Uh, <clears throat> I think five trips to Kenya, and each trip was about three weeks or something like mm -hmm. that. And we went to Norway with her, and then from in this country also. How long did that film take from the beginning to final form? That film took, from the beginning we started, we started thinking about it, doing it in 2002, and we didn't finish the shooting until 2006, and we didn't finish the editing in 2000, until 2008. That's a long time. Yeah. What do you feel are the more important parts of your work? I think um, sh just bringing stories to people through film, uh, stories that um, are meaningful, they respond to in some um, emotional way. It's the emotional response that films, good films create that's important. What are some of the parts of your job that you especially like? I mostly like to do camera work uh, and the challenge of that. Um, editing I like, but it's, it's hard work. And it takes a lot of time and you just have to grind it out sometimes. You just have to work at it and kind of get it. Because we don't have a script, we don't use a narrator, so we have to make the story work for, made up of all of the little the pieces that people say. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
What are the parts that you dislike about your job? Uh, the hardest part is the fundraising. Um, Lisa does more of that than I do. What are some of the ways the career of being a filmmaker has changed over the course of your career? Uh, the, the main difference has been we started using film, actual celluloid film. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then that gradually gave away to video. Um, it took quite a few years for that transition. Finally, I think now, um, the transition from f to video and to digital recording is, it's gotten, the digital cameras have gotten good enough that they kind of work with, as well as film used to work. And, and editing is also, you used to work with film, your hands, you'd slice it together, and now it's all, as you know, just done on a computer. Mm -hmm. What um, What do you see as the future of your work in Marlboro Film Productions? Well, I don't know. Uh, we never know what we're going to do. I mean, I kind of dream of that, doing some s sort of simple little films that I don't have to travel so far. And, you know, but then always some issue will come along and we just like, oh, we got to do that. And, jump on it. Mm -hmm. I'll figure on another three-year adventure. You know, that, that's, I think we just respond to what's, what's coming along. Aside from Ricky and Julianne, um, what people or experiences would you say have influenced you in your personal life and in what ways have they influenced you? Uh, um, <laughs> I like I, know, I like the small town life. Um, characters like David Holzapfel, Dan MacArthur, and yeah, you know, the, the people that live in that community. Um, they're important. Uh, getting to know your neighbors and, and that that's the a good for me a good balance to flying off all over the world. Mm-hmm. What do you speak about your maple syruping operation? Yeah, we just finished making um, 40 gallons of pretty good syrup this year. Uh, I just do it because I did it as a kid. I That was the best part of being on a farm, that and haying in the summer. And so my brother comes up from Georgia and we put up the buckets and sit out there in the sugar house and drink beer and make maple syrup. Um, what are some of your other interests outside of filmmaking, besides? Um, I like uh, uh, building and construction stuff, um, heavy equipment, mm -hmm. backhoes, trucks. Um, uh, traveling. Is there anything else about your life or work that you'd like to mention? that I haven't already asked you? Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Ah, yes, you're welcome. Yeah. Are you going to be f become filmmakers? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, for my project I did green screen and I studied a lot about filmmaking. Are you going to uh, do the VHS? Or? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking of doing some of their TV your production programs. To where? Um, UHS has like a TV production program, yeah. and I'm thinking of doing that. Yeah. Uh, Does your daughter go to UHS? Yeah. Well, no. She went, no, she, she did for a little bit. She went to Northfield Mount Hermon. Uh, she thought that was going to be really great. And a bunch of kids from that class went to private schools. And it was, it's... Have any of you considered going to Northfield Mount Hermon? I been? did for a little bit because I swim. And my dad worked at Eagleburg School in Massachusetts. Uh, okay. So it kind of connects in a way. It's, it depends on, you know, it was, she is a dancer. Mm -hmm. She's been studying dance and doing dance in Brattleboro for years. And Brattleboro had a really high level of uh, a dance school. And so she went to Northfield Mount Hermon and it was like playing with babies. You know, I mean, they, 
there was silly stuff that the dance teacher, their dance department was having them doing. And she, it was just really created this conflict for her. And the act, she did really well academically, but um, it just, anyway, it really got her in a pickle, I'll tell you. She finally left there after a year and a half and went to BUHS, um, thinking she'd keep studying with dance, but she couldn't, she couldn't stay on BUHS. She got into these classes with these kids that were, didn't want to be there, a level of everything. I mean, it's because she, she just came in in the mid-year and she wasn't part of it, um, it didn't work, and so she ended up, I mean, it was either homeschooling or, you know, what we're going to do with her. Because she was, she refused to go back. And we, so we found out of this place called Interlochen Arts Academy out in Michigan, where they, it's, they just do music and art and theater and film and mm -hmm. the high school. And we got her, she got in like a day before school started and, and um, they dance like six hours a day with, you know, really professional level. Stuff. And she's been pretty happy there. Uh, That's great. <laughs> What's the, t the school your father teaches at? Uh, he taught at Eagleburg School. It's like a middle school for all boys uh, in Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, my son went to the UHS and he did fine. He was a runner. He, you know, you've got to find some passion. If you're going to be HS, you need like a focus because if you don't, you're going to get caught up in stuff. Uh, you know, have a group of friends that you think are pretty cool and, and doing good good stuff. Yeah. And they're the ones that are you know kind of come through it pretty successfully. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you going to go to UHS? No, I'm going to the Compass School. Compass mm -hmm. is pretty cool. Yeah, they got a lot. Of, yeah. A lot more stuff goes on there. Yeah, that's where my dad teaches, so... Yeah. Where are you going to go now? Probably VHS. Yeah. Are you majored in... thinking of majoring in anything? No, not yet. Just yeah. liberal arts stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good yeah. Luck. Good luck with it. Thank you. Yeah. Alright. <sighs> Is Gordon here? Nope. Uh, what are you going to do with all this stuff? That's miles and hours of stuff. <laughs> yeah, we, whenever we're doing this, Gordon's uploading this all at the school, and then we edit the videos. And we have it on, we have it on the website. And then each, wow. pers each person we interview, there's a little page for them.